In chapter six, we're going to be looking at our first specific form of victimization with child abuse and neglect. It's a difficult chapter. A lot of these chapters are, but super important. Um, the reason that we, uh, not only in criminology, but psychology, social work, medicine, biology, the reason that we study child abuse from all of these perspectives is so that we can understand the scope of the problem, uh, understand uh, red flags, early red flags, so that we can create effective intervention programs and effective treatment programs. So understanding the scope of the problem. The National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System, which is a reporting system for all cases that come to the attention of Child Protective Services, provides an approach to obtaining statistics for child abuse and child neglect. So it's four approaches uh, to understand the occurrence of maltreatment. So collecting perspective data in selective communi communities. Um, and this just usually done through various reporting systems, but it allows us to uh, identify cases that are just not reported to Child Protective Services. Not every case, unfortunately, is, protect, is um, reported or even investigated. So um, going outside the parameter of Child Protective Services gives us a better idea of the scope of the problem. Um, asking adults about the details of how they have been treat, how they uh, have treated their children over a specific time period. Um, the problem with this is that, of course, not all adults who engage in abuse or neglect are going to be honest about that. We can understand that, um, but that is definitely a way in doing surveys. Uh, asking children, surveying children about their experiences of violence. Another problem with this uh, particular approach is that. Um, you have to have parental um, you have to have parental permission to do surveys on children, so that can be problematic. And then um, the last is asking adults how they were treated during their childhood, and that would probably get a lot more um, honest answers. For example, um, one study that asked adults in 2006 about um, child sexual abuse of adults in both Canada and the United States found anywhere from two to 62% of females had experienced some type of sexual abuse during childhood, and anywhere from three to 16% of men had experienced some type of sexual abuse during childhood. When um, we, again, look at the scope of the problem, uh, research shows high incidence of children's exposure to complex trauma, um, and that's just various types of child abuse. The National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System uh, is a voluntary reporting system in the United States that includes data from um, all 50 states and the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And this uh, this particular reporting system was developed by the Children's Bureau um, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and it was really created to collect data on child abuse and neglect and create uh, statistics and reports based on what they found. There are a couple of tables in your textbook um, on page 205 and 206 where you can read some of the findings from the uh, National Child Abuse and Neglect Data System. Additional studies, the National Incident Study, and I have their website here if you would like to take a look at this. Um, the National Incident Study is a congressionally mandated periodic uh, effort of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Um, that creates reports on data collected in various years. And you can see all of the, um, like the last one, the supplementary analysis in uh, the NIS-4 was the last one that was done. And you can click on these and see the reports in PDF form. And you can also see the reports that created, that they created to, um, to report back to Congress. Uh, so. It, one of the one of the things that it does here is, you know, we talked about how we try to get um, statistics and data outside of child protective services, which are the reported cases. And this particular study um, does attempt to get those cases that are outside the parameters of official statistics with child protective services. 
When we look at the legislative framework, um, it's important to keep in mind that you know children have always not always been a protected group. Um, really, here in the United States, um, after well, really during the Great Depression, the 1930s. Um, Childhood was kind of defined as a separate, um, a separate developmental stage for children. Um, at that time, kids were required to go to high school, for example. Before that, a lot of kids didn't even go to high school. Um, so it was really, you know, not until starting in the 1930s and the 1940s that we started to see children as a group that were developmentally different than adults and that they needed protection. Um, so in terms of some of the le legislation, the early legislation here in the United States, we had the first uh, Children's Aid Society, which was created in New York City in 1953. In 1974, the United States Congress passed um, the or enacted the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, which required all states to create policies and procedures for both investigating child abuse and reporting it. And of course, today we have um, the government is a major funder of child protective services that are provided by state and local, local, local authorities. And then, of course, every state also has funding for um, services like child protective services. Now, there's something called mandated reporting. If you're not familiar with this, it is anybody that comes into contact with children um, through their profession is required to report any um, any concerns about child abuse to Child Protective Services. Um, and, and really that's reasonable suspicion. Um, so if anybody suspects any type of abuse or neglect is going on and you work with children, you are required to report. So that includes things like doctors, of course, pediatricians, dentists, any healthcare worker, um, teachers, um, child care workers at daycare centers, anybody that, uh, again, in your profession, if you come into contact with children, you are required to report. And if you don't, um, you not only put a child at risk, but you can place, uh, be placed uh, in jeopardy of being prosecuted by the state. Now, I mentioned Child Protective Services. The role of Child Protective Services um, is to investigate cases that are suspected. So if anybody does report a case, it is the role of Child Protective Services to investigate those cases. Um, they create reports based on their investigations. Uh, they will, if an, investi if an investigation has found that a suspected case is substantiated, they are required to determine if the child is at risk. And if the child is at risk, they often have to place those children in foster care, which is not an easy decision um, by any means. Uh, they also can, in some instances, uh, help families find additional services, like therapy services um, uh, for the family if there, are, if there is neglect or abuse going on, um, financial help for families, food help for families, getting them on programs where they can get food if a child is maltreated in terms of not getting the food that they need or the medical services, giving, uh, help, getting them in touch with the health department, things like that. All right, when it comes to typologies of child maltreatment, the term child abuse um, has been broadened into an all-encompassing term now of child maltreatment. So child maltreatment includes neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional maltreatment. Physical abuse um, was first recognized in the 1960s. Remember, I told you it wasn't until the 19, really the 1930s and 1940s where we started to see kids as kind of separate and needing um, needing protection. Child sexual abuse really was not terribly looked at until uh, about the 1970s, and I know that that's hard to believe. Um, child neglect is the omission of care that results in significant harm. Um, so that can be things like inadequate food, clothing, shelter, supervision, medical care, education, can include things like abandoning your child, can be a one-time incident, but there's usually a pattern involved of unsafe care or not getting kids the things that they need, the basic things that they need. So when we're talking about food, clothing, and shelter, and supervision, and medical care, those are really the basics in life, but um, that is child neglect. Um, there is a, by the way, there's a chart on page 211 of your textbook that has some of the possible signs of child neglect.
physical abuse is um, is any type of um, physical contact that can cause harm to a child. Uh, here in the United States, um, it, it, there's kind of a gray area because here in the United States, corporal punishment is legal, which means spanking your children. So there's often confusion on what, you know, where the line is drawn between um, accepted corporal punishment and when does it cross over into um, actual physical abuse. Most, most professionals would suggest anytime something leaves a mark on a child, um, that would be considered physical abuse. Burns account for approximately 6 to 20% of abuse cases. There's other specific types of abuse, physical abuse. A shaken baby syndrome is one of those. Um, this is when a baby is shaken, and it doesn't have to be very hard, by the way, because um, babies don't have a really strong uh, connection development between the head and the neck and the body when they're born. And until those muscles in the neck really get strengthened over time, um, if you shake a baby even mildly, um, it can cause head trauma. Um, there are some studies that suggest the vast majority of deaths due to physical abuse involves some type of head trauma, and that includes shaken baby syndrome. Um, and uh, and even if a child lives with a, a shaken baby syndrome, um, they can have uh, cognitive deficits due to the brain damage that can happen with that. Uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is a form of child abuse in which the uh, parent or the uh, caregiver fabricates an illness um, in the child for the purposes of attaining um, attention from other people and from medical workers. Um, oftentimes they will cause the child to be sick. They'll give kids medicine to make them sick. I mean, there have been cases where um, hospitals that suspect this have put surveillance in hospital rooms and will show parents um, injecting children with stuff, putting stuff in their IV. Um, it's a very rare disorder, and the vast majority of offenders who engage in this type of behavior are women, by the way, moms, um, but it is a, a cry for attention from the uh, parent. Child sexual abuse. Um, child sexual abuse, of course, is one that uh, is, is, you know, really um, difficult for a lot of us to um, read about, to understand. Sexual abuse uh, includes physical contact, including the touching or exposing of sexual or other intimate parts of a person for the purpose of arousing or gratifying sexual desire in either the perpetrator or the child. Um, victims can um, range from infants to adolescents. I know that that's probably very hard to wrap your mind around. Um, Statutory rape is a crime uh, where you engage in sexual activity with a person who has not reached the age of consent. Um, the vast majority of st every state, by the way, has a different um, age of consent. And most states actually have a two-year gap, meaning that if an 18-year-old has consensual sex with a 16-year-old, that would not be considered statutory rape. But if a 16-year-old has a consensual sex with a 25-year-old, that would be considered statutory rape. Um, child pornography is another form of child abuse um, where a child is exploited uh, sexually. Uh, includes reproduction of uh, images, so photography, videos, um, slides, magazines, all those kinds of things, uh, passing those things around to other people, posing them uh, on the internet um, also. Um, psychological maltreatment, this is abuse, emotional abuse or, ne or neglect. Um, it's a repeating pattern where the caregiver um, uses verbal attacks on children to tell them they're useless and worthless and all those kinds of things. And over time, that can really impair a child. Um, table uh, 6.4 on page 214 has examples of psychological maltreatment. So go ahead and take a look at that. those examples. It is one of the most difficult forms of abuse to identify. Um, and it's one of those kind of like with physical abuse, it has kind of that gray area where parents may not understand where 
their words and patterns of behavior kind of cross the line over into psychological maltreatment. All right, theories on child maltreatment. Intergenerational transmission of violence. Um, this is when kids experience um, abuse, neglect, or even witness violence in their home during childhood, they can grow up to become abusers themselves. So they've done some, they've done a lot of studies on this, actually. Um, lo they've done longitudinal studies. Longitudinal means studying the same people over a long period of time. So you would test somebody at, you know, for example, 18, 28, 38. Um, so, um, so these longitudinal studies have shown that there is a correlation with the etiology of antisocial and criminal behavior in adulthood and um, forms of violence and um, abuse in childhood. Some of the things that they have connected in, in childhood, um, parental discipline, um, lack of supervision, family disruption, deviant parental characteristics. Um, they also found other factors like uh, having a home filled with conflict. Remember I said you can just witness abuse or uh, physical abuse, disagreements, um, other uh, parental difficulties like alcoholism or mental health problems. And they show that, uh, again, children that experience these things during childhood can grow up to um, have antisocial and criminal behavior and become abusers themselves. Um, this is often referred to in criminology and psychology as the cycle of violence. Um, social learning theory. Social learning theory is um, is based on the work of Albert Bandura um, in the 1960s, and he created um, social learning theory based on his famous Bobo doll study. And it suggests that a lot of people um, learn their behaviors by modeling, is his term, just imitating um, behavior that they see in other people. So it's the suggestion that um, if children um, grow up in a household where there is a violence, there's verbal abuse, there's physical abuse, um, that they learn those aggressive behaviors um, by modeling them from their parents. And children are very susceptible to modeling or imitating behavior, particularly um, with primary caregivers. All right, ecological theory. Um, this is a theory that suggests, um, or early on, it was suggesting that we needed to focus on parental psycho, uh, psychopathology. So um, that there were mental health issues um, in the household that were leading to child abuse. Um, later on, that was kind of uh, evolved a little bit to include abnormalities in the parent-child relationship. Um, it includes things like inappropriate parental expectations of the child, lack of empathy toward the child's needs, parental's belief in physical punishment, um, parental role reversal. Um, Belsky, um, who by the way was a was a college professor uh, at MTSU when I was there, um, I had Dr. Belsky um, for developmental psychology. Um, she believed that it went a little further, and it uh, also included um, cognitions and belief systems. So she she furthered it in, in saying that parental thoughts, feelings, and behaviors um, also play a role as well. And then we do have psychopathology, and just, just as it, this is just the concept that um, a parent has some type of mental health issue um, that contributes to mistreating their children or abusing their children. Um, so this could be things like um, depression, anxiety disorders, um, bipolar disorder, um, postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, um, substance abuse issues. All right, attention to prevention. Um, so one of the reasons that we study, um, as I mentioned at the top of this lecture, one of the reasons that we study um, this topic so closely is because we want to be able to prevent child abuse from happening. So one of the primary focuses of uh, child prevention, um, I'm sorry, for child maltreatment and abuse 
is strategies that have been put in place for those families, those parents who have been deemed to be at high risk. These are first time mothers, um, uh, lower socioeconomic uh, status families. And uh, if, if somebody is deemed to be at risk, they have some of these programs in place. And by these way, these programs are not widespread and they're very expensive because what they do is they have home visitors that go out um, during pregnancy and then after birth and then continue visiting the mother for the first five years of life. But these programs have shown to be very effective, by the way. Um, but it provides advice about effective parenting, helping people with um, their parenting skills, um, making good decisions about returning to school, daycare decisions, um, recognizing early problems related to family violence, seeing those red flags and trying to intervene, ensuring the child receives the medical care that they need. Um, also, nutrition needs are addressed, um, helping uh, these moms and families find um, community-based services if they might need those. Um, and it's really just designed as an early intervention program for those families that could be at risk based on some of the research to prevent child abuse and neglect from happening. All right, dynamics of disclosure in child abuse. Disclosure is telling somebody about the abuse. Uh, and we're talking about a child disclosing the abuse, by the way. It varies by the type of uh, maltreatment that the child has, has experienced. It varies by age. It um, you know, children, very young children might not have the verbal abilities to disclose the type of abuse that's going on. Um, but there are a lot of um, different things that suggest there could be something going on with, um, with a child. So you can see there's three types of sexual abuse disclosure. And that, and by the way, that would be any type of abuse, really. Immediate, delayed, and incremental. Immediate would be, you know, something happens to the child and they immediately tell somebody else. Delayed means um, that, you know, days, weeks, months, or even years later, they tell somebody. And incremental is they kind of give clues here and there, here and there, um, that something has happened. So um, the dynamics of sexual abuse are um, pressure sex, secrecy in known relationships, um, um, you know, abusers often, um, you know, if there's already an established relationship, um, they often tell them it's, you know, it's a secret. Don't tell anybody. This is just between me and you. If you tell somebody, I'll get in trouble. Um, if it's, you know, just a, a kind of a, a second, you know, not like a, somebody in the family, but maybe a family friend, they start to groom the child. Um, and again, because of this pressure and the secrecy and um, the guilt and the threats that are that are placed on victims, um, they might not disclose this type of abuse. Um, they may give subtle messages. Uh, they may there may be clues in their behavior. Um, we might see changes in their behavior. Um, that can be clues um, that abuse is going on. Um, page uh, On page 221 in your textbook, table 6.4 has uh, lists some of the causes of delayed disclosure of abuse, um, relationship of the victim to the offender, age difference, the younger the, uh, the victim is, the more difficult they might not have the language skills. Uh, pressure by the offender, threats, repercussions, if you tell this may happen, um, fears, emotions, there's a lot of different things that are going on that um, can cause children not to disclose the abuse. Effects of traumatic events on children. Um, research in the field of child maltreatment and neglect, and we're talking about all the different types of maltreatment and neglect, um, Research has really kind of focused on what are the short-term and long-term implications of child maltreatment. And we now know that it is not just a childhood problem. We're definitely gonna see behavioral issues in um, childhood, but we now know that a lot of people will uh, suffer from the, um, the really devastating impact of uh, abuse and maltreatment 
um, long into adulthood. So it's not just a childhood problem. It contributes to a lot of other um, issues that people will continue to have into adulthood. So some of the general symptoms uh, that we might see in children, um, and again, it depends on the type of abuse that's happening, but withdrawal behavior, depression, sleeping and eating changes, development of fears and phobias, um, psychosomatic symptoms like having stomach aches, headache, ache, headaches, not wanting to go to school, school problems, um, not just in absences, but in changes in grades. Um, they start to ignore um, or start to develop uh, poor hygiene habits. They can become really anxious, um, feel guilty. They often feel um, guilt and responsibility for the abuse. Um, they can feel um, a lack of trust, as you can imagine, betrayed. So there are a lot of different um, symptoms and changes in behavior that can be kind of red flags that something is going on. Um, again, there's no standard. Those are some of the typical things that we find. But again, it depends on the type of abuse, the age of the child. Um, children who are victims of sexual abuse may develop aversive feelings about sex. They might overvalue a sex. They might engage in kind of shockingly sexual behavior that's not kind of typical of uh, we would see of a particular age. Um, sexual identity problems, hypersexual or sexual avoidance. Um, that's something that can follow you into adulthood if you are the victim of child uh, sexual abuse is having problems with um, having intimate sexual relationships as an adult. Developmental traumatic, uh, trauma, traumatology is the key to understanding child trauma. Um, and this is looking at how children process trauma based on their age and level of development. So developmental psychologists um, do a lot of research in this area to try to understand how children experience trauma at different age levels and how they express um, how they express that trauma and what clinicians can do, what parents can do to respond and help them through the challenging time. Um, in general, uh, for children, a traumatic experience can cause ongoing feelings um, of concern about themselves, about the safety of others, about the safety of their parents. Again, remember threats are often involved in um, a lot of child abuse. So preschool children can lose recent acquired developmental milestones or regress. Regression is a Freudian term where kids will kind of um, backslip into a previous stage of development. So you might find um, a child that has been potty trained for five years might start wetting the bed again, um, for example, would be an example of regression. Um, some children process the event through post-traumatic play. Um, so you might see when people are, you know, children are playing house, there might be sexualized behavior or aggressive behavior. Um, adolescents may foster a radical shift in their views of the world. They might become self-destructive, reckless, um, engage in cutting behavior is common. Um, even suicide threats, alcohol and drug abuse, um, engaging in early sexual behavior. Um, even um, uh, adolescents who've been um, the victims of sexual abuse sometimes you know kind of fall into that circle of violence where they start sexually abusing younger children um, complex child trauma appears to be the most frequently uh, most frequently after extreme exposures to traumatic traumatic stress early in life so these are kids that um, have experienced uh, probably repeated really um, extreme uh, forms of child abuse or neglect. Um, the impairments that we find with complex child trauma include attachment and affective disorders in childhood and infancy. Um, attachment is uh, creating bonds to initially in, in infancy to primary caregivers, caregivers, but uh, later on to other people in their life making friends affective disorders. Uh, affective means emotion, so emotional disorders like um, anxiety and depression, um, which are you know, not something we typically see in early childhood. Um, 
aggressive uh, behavior, social anxiety, eating disorders, dissociative and physical problems, and then sexual disorders in adolescents and adulthoods. Um, I kind of talked about how um, adolescents who are um, who have been sexually abused often abuse younger children. Um, and then even into adulthood with that circle of violence. And of course, that puts everybody at risk for um, repeat victimization. Um, interesting um, research on women who've been the victims of sexual abuse um, during childhood. They often grow up to um, get into sexually abusive relationships or physically abusive relationships in adulthood. So um, women are kind of at a higher risk um, for that circle of violence to grow up and to get into abusive relationships. The causes of complex trauma are early sustained abuse that can produce physiological changes in the developing brain. Um, you know, children are born, um, when they're born, their brain is about 25% um, of the size of a normal, or, I'm sorry, of an adult brain. So there's a lot of uh, development that continues even after birth in the brain, you know, really the first three to five years, there's a lot of brain development going on in children, but we see the brain development continuing all the way up till age 25. It slows down after about age five, but any exposure to an abusive uh, environment can um, absolutely change the brain. Social bonding can fail or become narrow. Um, that's what I was talking about with attachment issues. That's being able to create appropriate bonds to other people, um, including friendships, and then even on into a, the teen years and adulthood, um, romantic relationships. The child who lacks protection by a caregiver, caregiver experiences anxiety, develops trust issues. Those trust issues can go long into adulthood. Um, they become isolated, disconnected from others. They often, um, you know, they don't want to, they don't trust people. So, so that really kind of contributes to that isolation. Um, and if they don't get treatment during childhood or during the teen years, that uh, those trust issues, those um, those bonding issues, those attachment issues uh, can really lead to disconnection from others, even on into adulthood, and make it difficult to um, have um, healthy adult relationships. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, that cutting behavior, um, other self-harm behaviors are often seen in victims of abuse, particularly sexual abuse. Um, at the extreme end of that, we have suicidal impulses and violence. Um, so suicide or uh, suicidal um, ideologies are um, really a pro you know, problematic with people who have experienced um, adverse childhood um, an adverse childhood or any type of sexual or physical abuse. It's considered to be one of the leading health problems in the United States um, and has been studied for a very long time. Um, more recently, you know, we have kind of looked at and found that connection between self-injury behaviors like cutting. Cutting has become kind of a, a, a you know, a real problem with people in terms of, um, injuring themselves um, in response to being abused. All right, cheap treatment um, for child victims. Of course, um, we want to be able to prevent child maltreatment and abuse um, uh, as much as possible. Unfortunately, um, you know, we do have a lot of cases that happen every year. So um, for those kids who are abused, we of course want to intervene and get them help as quickly as possible. The immediate concern is always for the safety and security of the child. So if we need to remove them from the home, um, remember I talked about child protective services can, will often put kids in foster care or they'll move them to um, the home of another family member if the home environment is not safe and secure. Um, once we know that a child is safe, uh, we will through crisis workers, and crisis workers, by the way, can be social workers, child protective service workers, but the goal of a crisis worker is to, again, make sure that the child is safe and secure, and then to um, guide families to the appropriate organizations for services um, in terms of therapeutic services for children. A couple of different types of therapy that your textbook talks about for children. And again, it will depend on the age of the children. Um, it'll depend on 
the uh, level of trauma and the the number of um, symptoms that the child is um, displaying um, from the trauma. Uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. This is called EMDR. This is kind of a newer um, approach to therapy. Uh, it was introduced by Francine Shapiro in the 1987. It's mainly been used in treating um, both adults and children with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and PTSD is common among children who've experienced abuse and neglect. Um, and what it is is um, thinking about a disturbing image or a disturbing memory or or difficult emotions. And once they make the connection, once the, the person has kind of made the connection with those difficult things, um, they move their uh, eyes back and forth um, following the therapist finger. And this eye movement back and forth for a period of time is said to, um, said to reduce, if it's continued for a long period of time, reduce the anxiety and stress associated with that particular incident or that particular memory or that particular, um, that particular cognition. Trauma-focused cognitive, trauma -focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, this is an effective, a treat, this is a pretty effective a treatment for sexually abused children, including those who've experienced multiple other traumas at the same time, so poly victims. Um, with this particular type of therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy is, um, is kind of the gold standard in psychology in general in terms of a form of therapy because it not only focuses on behavioral issues, it also focuses on cognitions, and that is thinking processes. So it takes a child and parent um, approach, generally speaking, both working, working with both the, uh, we're, it's working with the family, but you know, working with the child and then working with the parent when possible. Um, in helping them to, um, you know, work through um, those really difficult situations, uh, the cognitive aspect, to understand that they weren't in fa at fault, to uh, help them deal with the guilt, to help them deal with the anxiety, um, and then also focusing on any maladaptive behaviors that are a result of those thinking patterns. So, um, any if they're having any of those acting out behaviors like cutting. Um, um, like uh, drinking or uh, drug abuse, um, uh, sexually abusing younger children, th those types of things, focusing on those kind of maladaptive behaviors at the same time that you're focusing on those, uh, those, those thinking patterns associated with the trauma. All right, so I know that this is a challenging topic, uh, but it's incredibly important to be able to uh, identify the early risk factors and that can help us create prevention programs, intervention programs, and effective treatment programs. All right, if you have any questions about anything in this chapter, let me know. Otherwise, have a great rest of the day.